David Hume. Uh, whoops, make sure I'm showing my screen. Okay. Uh, David Hume. So Uh, George Berkeley, I, I, I talked about him early, earlier on, and I, I don't want to go into more detail about him. Uh, he is considered an empiricist, so he fits into this, uh, but he has some very idealist sort of I, uh, metaphysics. Um, <clears throat> so David Hume. Um, now, David Hume really... really begins to question empiricism. So he's known as a skeptic, uh, which means he, he tried to put everything into question. Um, Descartes, you know, he's, he had this idea of radical doubt. I'm gonna doubt that everything is real and that's a kind of skepticism. But as I discussed before, his skepticism was a kind of stunt show to pretend like he was doubting everything and then rebuild everything exactly the way uh, everybody wanted it, uh, but then also throwing in these little tweaks that then cause lots of problems uh, afterwards. Okay. Um, David Hume is a is a serious skeptic. And wanted to suspend judgment on anything that wasn't proven. Uh, but he is thinking in empiricist terms. He is thinking along the lines of Locke primarily but also, I don't know if I have real evidence for this, but I suspect in the way that he writes is that he's also reading German uh, metaphysics and taking it seriously. So he's taking ideology seriously, but he is more inclined to an empiricist view but he's questioning all the metaphysical assumptions that Locke made. And this is, this is just a couple of generations after Locke uh, in the beginning of the 18th century. And when he really begins to question Locke, and think about what really can be concluded, he comes to a, a radical, radically different way of, of looking at the world. Um, and Hume gains a high reputation as a philosopher from, uh, especially in his later life. At first, he wasn't taken very seriously but uh, in his later life, he was taken very seriously. And he's very clear in his argumentation. And for English speaking philosophers, David Hume is considered uh, the best at English. <laughs> you know, uh, maybe not everybody agrees with his philosophy, but they agree that he clearly explains, uh, you know, what he's trying to say in English. Um, so he has a, a, a great facility for the English language that makes it hard to argue against him because not all of us have as great of command of the English language as he does. So David Hume is very influential among English speaking philosophers, um, not so much so amongst other philosophers, but he's taken seriously. But, but especially for English speaking philosophers, you have to take what he's saying seriously just because uh, he closes the gaps by his precise 
and eloquent use of English. Um, so it has a it has a weird uh, power over English speaking philosophers. Um, now he 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 questions the fundamental assumptions of Locke and and really does away with them. So he doesn't assume that there are atomic particles. Uh, he doesn't assume that the mind is some blank slate. Um, He's willing to consider the distinctions of primary and secondary qualities and simple and complex ideas, but his concern is more showing that a lot of what Locke did assume is not in evidence. And so Hume, now, although he's considered an empiricist, really bridges the gap between uh, rational idealism and empiricism. He doesn't want to commit to either way of looking at things, and he wants to show how little we know at this metaphysical level. And so um, he is non-theoretical about the self. He doesn't believe that there is a soul. He doesn't believe that there isn't a soul. He's non-committal on that. And he doesn't believe that there are innate ideas or that there are not innate ideas. He's not committing to that. He's withholding judgment. And that's what it means to be skeptical, is to consider uh, alternative interpretations, but to withhold judgment until you feel absolutely compelled to do so. And, and just to be OK with saying, I don't know. And, and let, but let's look at it. Let's look at what we do know. And, and what he essentially uh, comes to show and what's very fundamental and, and how he undoes Lockean metaphysics and even shows uh, and even, uh, well, the, the way that he undoes Lockean metaphysics is in this way, um, you know, uh, I like to use the example of billiard balls. So of, of like on a pool table, um, you have two balls colliding. So you have, let's say you have the eight ball and you have the cue ball, the cue ball, and let's just imagine, let's not worry about the stick and everything, but just imagine the cue ball coming into frame and you, and you watch it and it hits the eight ball and then the eight ball moves away. So you have this physical interaction moves away. What he wants to say about this is that what we know is that we see the cue ball come into frame. We see it uh, meet physically. And he, and he doesn't want to question things to say, well, is it really meeting or, you know, he's not questioning all that. but. He wants to focus on a certain aspect of it that he's going to question for the time being, but he, he does assume a lot about sensual perception as coming from the outside world. He does make that empiricist assumption uh, because he wants to point to some more fundamental problems that undermine Lockean metaphysics. But he's like, okay, let's assume that we are watching the the real world, okay. Where does, he's not questioning that we're seeing what we see. Um, so he's not doing some radical skepticism or radical doubt that the way that Descartes pretends to. He's just saying, let's make certain basic assumptions that really nobody's doubting in these empiricist circles, but then let's look at the real metaphysical issues and let's doubt those. And so we, what we do see and he believes this is real, like we really do see the cue ball and we see it uh, make contact, come into the same space, 
as the eight ball, and then the eight ball moves away. Let's not question that. But what most empiricists want to say and almost habitually say or say without thinking is that the cue ball causes the motion and impact of the cue ball on the eight ball causes the motion of the eight ball. And he says we have no evidence for that causation. That that causal assumption is just that. It's an assumption. It's a metaphysical assumption. And uh, notice that when we see the cue ball come up and make contact with the eight ball and then the eight ball moves away, we don't see something that is the cause. We don't perceive the cause. So he's like, okay, we perceive the, the cue ball. That's not a question. We perceive the whiteness and all that. And we perceive the eight ball and we perceive the motion. But what is missing from the picture and what is not part of the perceptual record is the cause. The data includes the motion of the cue ball and includes the motion of the eight ball and their positions, but the data do not include this causation that you speak of. That's not in the record. So where does this causation come from? Where does this idea, and it is an idea, it's not a physical object. Okay, so this is where he's straddling, he's straddling the, the divide between empiricism and, and idealism. The causation is an idea. And so he wants to ask us, and ask us to ask ourselves, where does that idea of causation come from? And then what he develops is a very kind of empiricist uh, theory of this, um, which is, we might say, even psychological. So he has a psychological explanation for this, is that somehow human beings are structured in such a way that when we see the cue ball hit the eight ball, we naturally understand there to be a causation there. But that's something about the human mind that brings the idea of causation to what we observe. Now, the rationalist might uh, conceive this as like an innate idea. He avoids uh, making that claim, so he's just going to suspend judgment. But he's like, all I know is I'm not perceiving the cause. The causation is a psychological interpretation of what I perceive. And uh, and he doesn't want to go into specifics about that. He doesn't want to create like a Cartesian model or, you know, like in all the problematics that we saw with the pineal gland with Descartes, he kind of backed himself into a corner uh, that was not very fruitful. Hume just wants to say, I, I'm not gonna explain that. I'm just telling you that it's not in the perceptions. So then we need some other explanation and he just generally states the case, okay? It just states what we in fact do know, that there's no causation perceived and that somehow we naturally build into it the perception of causation. And that causation really is this inclination, he, he wants to call it like a habit of the human mind 
to see causation in perceptions like billiard balls colliding, but we see it in, in lots of different ways. But the billiard balls colliding now, um, that specific example, if we think about atoms colliding, is the same sort of thing. And Lockean metaphysics depends upon atoms colliding and causing these chains of events. And so the whole atomic theory uh, is not well founded metaphysically from Hume's perspective. So this is, a, this is really a, a uh, disastrous consequence for Lockean metaphysics, which people continue to believe without question and laugh at people who don't believe it for hundreds of years, okay, but Locke is sitting there, you know, and anybody who reads it is like, oh man, he has a point, you know, and especially if you're an English speaker, it's, and it's the English speakers in particular that like this atomic theory, you know, there's some real, there's a real problem here, and it's, and it's hard to avoid the problem. Um, okay, so let me look at my notes here again. So, so the whole idea of a tabula rasa in the mind and being caused by particles, you know, coming through the perceptual apparatus from the apple, all that kind of stuff, that whole causal explanation, Hume has shown that the causation is a problematic idea. And so that doesn't really serve as an explanation of the human mind. Uh, And, and it also, you know, draws into question whether a, a, a atomic, the atomic theory of reality makes any sense at all, because causation is such a fundamental part of this. Um, okay. And this is not to say that Newtonian physics is wrong. He's not arguing against Newtonian physics. He's just saying conceptually causation is a problem. Uh, the math of Newtonian physics obviously works, um, but these metaphysics, okay, that doesn't work. And what this opens up though about the human mind is this discussion that he has of habits, that we have a habitual way of seeing causation here. Like we know what we mean by causation in an ordinary everyday sense. There's just no deep philosophical foundation for that. But the concept still functions, even though it doesn't come from our perceptions. And we just need to be aware of that. Again, he's not trying to then give some alternative explanation. He's just saying this empirical explanation doesn't make sense. Um, and uh, what I want to And I should have a, another point here, I think, in the, in the outline, is another aspect, a, a big aspect of what Hume is doing is that he's undermining uh, ideological, like German ideology, he's undermining the assumptions of German ideology at the same time. So he's undermining uh, Lockean atomic metaphysics and undermining German ideology simultaneously. 
uh, for one, because he, uh, and he has to be very careful about this um, because he's living in a, uh, a society that persecutes atheists. Um, but what he does do without claiming to be an atheist and in fact claiming to be a true believer of Protestant um, Presbyterian, so I talked about Presbyterianism, um, uh, a Presbyterian, uh, he's Scottish, uh, so he, he claims to be an authentic believer in Presbyterian Christianity, um, but shows that we don't know anything about God. <laughs> and, and all the claims of religion are things that are unjustified. Um, and he does that quite convincingly. Um, he sometimes he frames it as dialogues. And so he puts these arguments in the mouth of other people. Uh, but in his in his most uh, decisive uh, treatment of this, he talks about miracles. And he does it very concisely, doesn't take a lot of, and that's the thing, is he doesn't use extra words. Uh, in his earlier writings, he gets a little, you know, he multiplies words in, in an unnecessary way. But in his later writing, he condenses everything down uh, to very uh, clear, clearly worded um, analyses. And he shows very clearly that the evidence for miracles is 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 un, is not there that there is no evidence for miracles that there's a whole sequence of things that he, he, he argues and and then you know a lot of the authority of the bible and of religion is based upon miracles like miracles are supposed to be the authentication of the ideology like the concept of God, for example, or the concept of the soul. And he shows that that, that doesn't work. Uh, but then right at the end, he says, but you know, I'm a, I'm a true believer in the Presbyterian, you know, beliefs and everything, you know, so this is like a daily miracle that I experience every day and I experience the miracle. It's a fucking miracle that I believe this because there's no reason to believe it. I just, somehow miraculously believe it, um, you know, but he explicitly says the right things. And, um, and of course, undermines not only Presbyterian, Anglican, Protestant uh, Christianity, but, um, but also German ideology. And, uh, but, but then in some ways that's, part of his empiricist credibility is that he's arguing against spiritual mumbo jumbo metaphysics, uh, you know, against miracles and God, but he toes the line in sort of in a Anglican conformist sort of way. Doesn't matter what he believes in public, he professes and makes all the oaths, you know, to conform. Um, but but if you unpack what he's saying, he's really uh, called into question some of these fundamental concepts that are essential for like a Leibnizian monadology. If there is no soul, because we don't have evidence for it, and we're withholding judgment, how does the monadology get off the ground? Okay, so so that's a that's a that's a big problem. Um, Leibniz just assumes that everybody believes that there are souls and and kind of works from there. And Descartes just assumes that every that everybody believes there are souls, and then he has the problem of mind-body dualism. Uh, but Hume says, he says, I'm not saying that there aren't souls, I'm just saying you have no good reason to say that there are. And at a fundamental level, you're assuming that there are. Okay. 
so uh, again, David Hume makes this bridge between uh, idealist rationalism and empiricism and, and plays both sides against each other, but uncovers some fundamental metaphysical problems. 